Well, it's Palm Weekend, Palm Sunday. But since we meet on Saturday night, we're going to call it Palm Weekend. Tomorrow morning, it'll be Palm Sunday. But you may notice on the cross, there's purple. And this is also the first weekend of the month and we serve communion. And you're used to seeing white on the cross. And Sharon and I had a discussion about this before the service started. And we got a little confused and I had to look it up and make sure. But yes, it's purple. Because today we actually celebrate the king coming to town. And purple is the royal color. And so during Lent here, purple has been our color of our pyramids because we've been preparing ourselves for six weeks now for the king who's coming. We know who the king is. And there's some people that are going to welcome him on this day to Jerusalem. They're going to call him king. I don't know that they really know what he's king of. They're going to try to figure that out. And there was a lot of confusion in those days about what exactly the Messiah was going to do. Because some thought the Messiah was going to come on a horse with a sword and with power and to not just redeem Israel, but to toss the Romans out, make their city free, free of the oppression, the yoke of tyranny, the heavy taxation. And they were going to be able to be God's people. Most of them in their lifetime said no, nothing but Roman rule. There may have been one or two elders that knew before that time, but likely not many. And in today's reading, we're going to hear about Jesus traveling to Jerusalem. And he stops at this little village called Bethpage, which is between Bethany and Jerusalem. You go from Bethany over the Mount of Olives. And as you're going down the hill from the Mount of Olives, there's this little village called Bethpage. And Bethpage is kind of like right there at the city limits of Jerusalem. They butt right next to each other. And so when you leave Bethpage, you're in Jerusalem. When you leave Jerusalem, going that direction east, you go through Bethpage. And it's in Bethpage that Jesus is going to pick up a ride on a colt, a donkey, and it's colt. You know, only in Matthew were the two mentioned a donkey and a colt. Only in Matthew. You know, we've heard it. There's one, there's two, there's one, there's two. That's because in the other Gospels, they mention the one. In Matthew, it's the two. And also in Matthew, you might remember last year when we were in, in uh, uh, Luke. In Luke, they threw the palms on the ground. Remember I wore the cloak that I took off and laid on the ground? In Matthew, they lay their cloaks down, but it's not palm branches. It's just branches. Doesn't mention the palms in Matthew. Curious. And there's two. And they put the blankets on both, and Jesus rides both of them. You'll hear that in the reading too. But what I want you to hear is this word, Hosanna. This is going to be in the reading. Hosanna is an interesting word. Learned a lot about that this week. Hosanna derives from a Hebrew root word that is the same word that ends up being Jesus' name. The Hebrew word for Hosanna is also used in the phrase Yahweh saves, which we understand as Yeshua. You've heard Yeshua? Which when Yeshua is converted to English, guess what it comes out as? Joshua. Where we get Joshua, okay? But if you take it the roundabout way, Yahweh saves, Yeshua, and you run it from Hebrew into Greek first, it comes out, comes out to Azus. Azus. And when you translate that to English, you get Jesus. See, sometimes I think that we as modern 21st century people, as smart as we are, and as dumb as we've gotten since the Enlightenment, We've actually lost some of the richness from those ancient languages. When I learned things like I did this week about that name, that word, Hosanna, Yeshua, Yahweh saves, and all these, how it works its way through to Jesus. I was envious of my classmates at seminary that took Hebrew. 
See, I took ancient Greek because I wanted to be able to translate what was in the original New Testament. All those gospel letters and the letters by Paul and Hebrews and Revelation. I wanted to hear and be able to read the original versions. When there was a dispute over what a word means in our English Bibles, I was going to be that guy that whipped out my Greek New Testament and look it up. And because when I took ancient Greek, 40-some years after my last grammar lesson in junior high school, the best I could squeeze out was a C-plus for two semesters. And those two semesters kept me from graduating summa cum laude. So I was determined not to take a language again and further damage my grade point. So this week when I was learning this about Yahweh saves and Yeshua and getting to Jesus, man, maybe I should have taken Hebrew after all because once you missed honor, what's the difference? But the truth of the matter is we should look at things like this. You know, uh, uh, Hosanna appears no place in the New Testament except in the gospel narratives where they talk about Jesus coming to Jerusalem on this day is the only place in the New Testament that Hosanna appears. And the only place it appears in the Old Testament is in Psalm 118, verse 26, that was read to us, where it says, Save us, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, in the Hebrew, that psalm would have said, Yahweh saves. In our translation, it says, Save us. There's a richness in Scripture, that all too often we just read right by. How many years have we heard on Palm Sunday, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and all the different Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the John versions and all those. And did we know that Hosanna is actually a way of connecting Jesus in that? They're shouting, Jesus. And see, some of those people in those crowds that knew Hebrew would have known that connection. They cheated us. All these years we've been cheated because we didn't know that. Now, did y'all have a preacher tell you that before? Yeah, I didn't either. And I only learned it this week, so I'm sharing that with you because that goes with my commitment to make the people who attend Grace Wesleyan the smartest Christians in town. So now you know what Hosanna means. Let's go to today's scripture in Matthew. We're going to pick up in chapter 21. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Now Jesus has been on this journey. He's coming to Jerusalem. But he stops right at the edge of Bethpage on the other side, Mount of Olives side. And he's got to hook up a ride. So let's hear what happens. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. For me now, it's impossible to read Hosanna and not read Yahweh saves. God saves. They, they knew what that meant when they were saying it. Now we know what they meant when they were saying it. But it's a pretty good bet that none of them 
knew the saving was going to take place on the cross. We know it now, but they didn't know it then. And so when Jesus came into town, it says the town was stirred. The town was stirred because the normal population of Jerusalem at that time was about 40,000. But during Passover, that pilgrimage time, the sea would swell to over 200,000. It's sort of similar to spring break. Snowbirds are here. Spring breakers come to town. There is no place to go without it being crowded. The town is stirred up. Anybody relate to that? And along with that, Pilate came to town just before Jesus did because he knew all the pilgrims were coming. And historically, just a few decades before, a large revolt occurred during Passover. Remember that? We talked about that. Because with all those pilgrims there, the Romans were concerned about, okay, we're letting these Jewish people have their little celebration. We're letting them have their festival, their little holy thing. But a lot of them show up. And the town gets five times bigger. That's a time a lot of troublemakers could kind of like squeeze in and cause a lot of trouble. So Rome showed up in force. Pilate came from his little fortress with a bunch of soldiers. And they came into town. And Roman soldiers were everywhere. The town was stirred up. And Jesus comes in from the east end. The other end from where Pilate came in. He comes in close to the temple end. And they're shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were calling him King and Messiah. And all the buzzwords were going on. And other people were saying, who is this guy that all these people are laying down their cloaks and throwing branches on the road for? And according to Matthew, he's riding on two colts, a donkey and a colt. I can't hardly picture that, but Jesus could do anything, so it's okay. But it got a lot of attention for those in that part of town. And they understood he's saving, saving them from what? Well, if you were Jews and you'd been oppressed... You wanted to be saved from Rome. Sure enough, we know about that part of the Messiah's trip. But then there were other people that had heard about some of the miracles. And they'd heard this guy named Jesus was doing these miracles. You might be surprised to learn that Jesus was a relatively common name in those days, somewhere along the lines of like uh, John or David. Fairly common. So when they said, who is this person that's causing all this story? This is Jesus of Nazareth because that's what they did they would tie him to their dad's name if he was well known from right there in town or they would tie their first name to the town they were from to differentiate people people knew this Nazarene teacher preacher guy was going around through the plains of Galilee and healing people and performing miracles and feeding 5,000 with a couple of fish and some bread loaf biscuits they heard about all that Many had not seen him, but they heard. Oh, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet. So those people want to be saved from infirmities. There were some people that want to be healed. And believe it or not, there were people that wanted to be saved from the Pharisees and the yoke of the faith that had been laid on them that was so heavy that the best anybody could manage to do was just be a sinner. Because with 613 laws, it's impossible to get out of bed in the morning practically and not sin somehow. And the Pharisees were quick to point it out. So people walked around with this emotional and spiritual yoke, heavy, all the time. I'm a sinner. And when you see the Pharisees coming around with all their fancy robes and the, and the Sadducees, the rich elites, and the, the priests and the people who were all doing good, looking good, smelling good, God must have blessed them because look at them, they have riches. And our ancestors must have sinned greatly because we have to till the land. We struggle. The taxes are heavy. We can barely make it. We work one day to the next to earn a denarii to be able to buy that day's food for our family. 
Life is tough. We need to be saved from that existence. Life was hard then. So Yahweh saves was on the lips of everyone in Jerusalem at that time. They came during that pilgrimage to pray and to hope that God might break through and do like the God of old did and redeem His country, redeem His nation, make His people free and prosperous and healthy and full again. That's what they came for. That's what they hoped for. Kind of like us today. People today struggle under all kinds of yokes. We work hard all our lives. And then things happen. The economy goes south. Our savings accounts get cut by a third or half. Overnight, it seems like. People lose their jobs because of pandemics. And after the pandemic, they can't get as good a job as they had before. So they work two or three Have you ever noticed how many senior citizens are working in jobs these days? A lot. A lot. Because they have to. They have to supplement their retirement and stuff to get by because things cost more. People are under a yoke, an economic yoke. And then there's people today that struggle with what the culture's telling them. They hear things that don't exactly jibe with what they understand how life's supposed to be. If you grew up a life as a Christian... You had an idea what the Bible told you about who you were, how the world's supposed to work, and how things are supposed to be. It's the Bible truth narrative. It's, it's the worldview of Christians. It's the worldview of God the Creator. God has a purpose for our lives. And the world's telling us that we can be anything we want to be. And we never understood it to be that way because God has a plan for us. And we understand our only way to have joy and peace and happiness is to try to find that path that God has for us. And a few weeks ago, I gave everybody an envelope that had God's plan for your life in it. And you opened it up. And there was a signature line at the bottom. And the page looked blank. And some of you first thought was, what? This isn't a plan for my life. But you know what? God's plan for our life, as we talked about, is most often hidden from us for a little bit. We live into it. And God writes His plan for our life as we go along walking the path that God puts before us and trying to be faithful to God in the place we're planted. Because see, we make choices with our free will along the way and we deviate from God's path. Almost none of us are on the path that God laid out for us originally. If we're lucky, we're on God's path now because God managed to rescue us from the path we decided for ourselves and all that trouble, angst, anxiety, heartache, the yoke of free will run riot in our lives. And we cried out one day, God, save me. God, help me. I can't do this anymore. We found ourselves standing in the kitchen, leaning on the counter saying, God, I can't do it. I just can't do it. God, you got to help me. And when we welcomed God into our life, then things started to change. For some of us, the changes were dramatic. For some of us, not so much. But all of us experienced that change of heart that comes from that pardon where God God pardoned us from our sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. See, He came to Jerusalem today for a purpose. And not everyone, almost no one understood what that purpose was, but Jesus knew. He came to save us. So what do we need saving from today? Well, just yesterday, Annette and I are driving down the road. And suddenly we find out there's a tornado just hit Little Rock. That's where we're from. Our kids are there. My mom lives there. Thankfully, she wasn't there. We find out that my oldest daughter was at her office. The sirens went off. Because there they have tornado sirens. They sound like air raid sirens. She heard the sound, so she walked to the door to look out. And she started seeing stuff flying across the parking lot. She backed off and got as far away from the windows as she could. And about that time, the windows all blew in. She works in a a high-end boutique, and they have all these fancy clothes in the windows, the whole front of the store's windows. 
It blew them all in. Glass was flying everywhere. Glass and clothes and stuff. People's cars in the parking lot were knocked into each other and blown over on top of each other and all that. Her car was left by itself. But she did lose one of her windows. One of her windows blew out from the pressure or something. I don't know. But when it all settled down, she got in her car and left. She didn't even say anything to her boss. She didn't ask. She She just got in her car and left because she only lived about eight blocks from there. Fortunately, she was able to make it home because the way she went home, that street wasn't blocked. But the other way, that road was shut down. And that sister-in-law, her office was right around the corner from my daughter's office. She stepped outside for a second and then ran back inside. And the windows were blown out on her office too. She watched houses being destroyed, debris blowing through, lumber, shingles, all kinds of stuff. Obvious houses being destroyed right there behind her, blowing by, out into the streets. The man that Annette worked for there in Little Rock, he lived in a, that part of town where you're seeing all the pictures. The storm went less than 200 yards from his house. 200 yards from his house is what you're seeing on TV houses, two and three story houses leveled. But Bruce's house survived. All of our kids are okay. Our grandchildren were in their daycares. They were fine. Our granddaughter, her daycare, they took them down to the storm shelter and kept them there until the parents came and picked them up. Our son works at a, 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 a gastroenterologist uh, outpatient surgery clinic. And that surgery clinic became a triage center for that part of town because the hospitals were overwhelmed. There was only one level one trauma center there in Little Rock, and it... it called an emergency because it had more people coming in than they could tend to. And so they were asking these other surgery centers and stuff around town to be triage centers so they could send ambulances and stuff to them so people could get the treatment that they needed. You think those people in Little Rock were, were asking God yesterday, God save me? God save us? They shouted Hosanna in English. God save Save us. And fortunately, nobody in Little Rock died. There were dozens injured. Yeah, there were, there were people that did die around town. One died in North Little Rock, the other side of the river where I grew up. People died down the road. But right there in that little pocket, no. See, we go through calamity sometimes in a split second, just like that. People got up yesterday morning just going on with their lives, just like we do every day. Do we pray to God when we leave the house? Jesus, come with me today. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yahweh, save me today. It's a pretty simple thing to ask. The people that day said it, welcoming Jesus to town. Now we know in five days they're going to have a slightly different tune. But right now, that's what they're doing. See, we call Jesus at two times. We call Him when we celebrate Him coming. Jesus, come save us. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us throw our cloaks down. Let us throw branches down. Welcome to town, Jesus. Come save us. And then the other time, when things are stirred up, when our life is a calamity, when at the drop of a hat, everything changes. Because when tornadoes, I, I tell people all the time, they, say, they have hurricanes down there in South Florida. Oh, yeah. But at least we get like four, five, six days notice usually. Except in Andrew, we still get some notice up there. No one yesterday morning got up thinking a tornado was coming yesterday afternoon about 1 o'clock. But it did. So we call on Jesus when we're glad. When we're glad He's here. And we call Him when stuff hits the fan. As your pastor, I'm concerned about that part in the middle. That part where we, we're running our lives. We got this. It's going good. It's okay, God. I left my house today. I'm good. I'm fine. 
until something happens. Can we invite Jesus to be in our lives during the time that's in the middle between when we're thanking Him for the blessing and we're asking Him to save us? Can we talk to Jesus in those quiet and easy times? Build the relationship with Jesus during those quiet and easy times. Welcome Him. Hosanna. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, come on in. I have to ask Jesus into my life every day. Sometimes, hour by hour, I really get myself in a pickle. To every minute, Jesus, you still there? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you still there? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you still there? Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes life gets that tough. He's always there, though. He came today to Jerusalem. That's what we celebrate. We have our little palm crosses. I encourage you to take those, mash them in your Bible, make them flat, use them as a bookmark. One, one time I took one of mine and I stuck it on my visor in that little rod that clips it on and it hung on my visor hanging down the passenger side for like four years and then finally one day it gave way and broke and fell down. But it wore out. Put it someplace you're going to see it, either in your Bible, because you're reading your Bible. I know, people go to Grace Wesley and read your Bible like every day. That's what I said, put it in your Bible. But in case you don't, put it someplace where you'll see it. Stick it on your refrigerator. Stick it on your door. Stick it in your car. Just remember, Jesus came to save us. And that's what that represents. Him saving us. From all the things we did, the things that happened to us, when we need Him, He's there. We just got to ask. Yesterday when Annette and I were praying, we found all this is going on. The thing that kept us from going into a full state of panic with our kids right there in that part of town where this was happening was the fact that we knew Jesus. And we could look at our hearts and we knew that there was peace there. Didn't change our mental anxiety, but our hearts had peace knowing that our kids had just gone through something terrible. They were all okay. I invite you to experience that in your life. Just allow Jesus to come in, not just when we're happy, not just when things are tragic, but all in between too. Can we do that? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.